introduce Onaje Allen Gums. Have a seat. I'll just mention before we begin that this series is videotaped, as all of our uh, interviews are, for the archives of the Jazz Museum. So some of the questions I ask might seem, the answers might seem to be kind of patently obvious to us who are here on this particular summer day in 2007, but people will be looking at it and reading the transcript of it in years to come, so we just to establish the, uh, the context for it. Welcome, sir. Thank you. So happy to have you. Well, I'd like to begin just with some basic questions. Uh, the first one would be, when and where were you born? I was born in um, 1949 at uh, Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital in mm -hmm. Harlem. Mm -hmm. And the first six years of my life, I lived on 132nd Street in Madison. Tell us about um, your family, your mother, your father, how they wound up in Harlem. How did they come here? When did they come here? Well, um, my mother is from Munster, and my father is from Angola. So I'm full blood West Indian. And um, they got married. Well, my mother came with uh, her sisters. Actually, what happened is that she was, she was coming from Montreal, but she was very sick as a child. And um, my grandmother wanted to make a trip to New York. And they told her that uh, my mother wasn't going to make it because she's too sick. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that you probably have to throw her overboard before you get to New York. Thank God. Um, so my great-grandmother, every morning, took her to the beach and covered her up in sand until high noon. And did it every day, I don't know how long, but my mother got stronger. Mm -hmm. She got very much, very strong, and she was able to make it to New York. When was it? Approximately when was it that they came? Was it shortly before you were born or many, many this years was before? Like the, um, the early 40s. I early see. 40s. And your mother's name was? Edna. 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 And your dad? Nick Nichols. No A, just Nichols. N I C H. N I C H O L S. Right, right, right. And how was, I mean, why did they come here? I mean, what was it? Was it with their families that they came? Or, well, obviously, it was. Know, uh, my grandmother came first. Mm -hmm. She wanted to get out of Montserrat and wanted to come to New York, and someone had invited her to mm -hmm. come. So she came, and then one by one, she sent for the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, they lived on 112th and 7th Avenue. And um, what was interesting is that um, my, never knew my, never knew my grandfather, but my grandmother and my grandfather's history is almost parallels Malcolm X's mother and father because my mother, my grandmother, was very light skinned. Mm -hmm. um, because my great grandmother had been molested in Montserrat and my grandmother was born. So she was very, very light skinned. Matter of fact, she was at the beach with one of my cousins, and um, his name was Donald. And um, she said, Donald, get back over here. And he said, okay, Grandma. So me and the people said, okay, because my cousin was dark skin. And they looked at, okay, what's happening here? <laughs> my, my grandma could put a passport. Right. And her husband, my grandpa, was very dark. Hmm. Also a cardiac, just like Malcolm's father. Hmm. Um, so it was very interesting when I finally saw the movie because uh, Lynette McKee, so sort the of movie reminded me of my family, mm. you know. Mm. So, um, and my uncles and aunts, they were like, you might say, the colors of the rainbow. Because my, my uncle, Ruben, was very dark skinned. Mm -hmm. And it's like wavy hair. Mm -hmm. He was very dark skinned. And my mother was much lighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, my aunts. So it was, it was a nice cross section. So, um, it was something that helped me in that respect to really understand humanity before dealing with color or race or whatever, mm -hmm. because I grew up around that. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew my grandma was my grandmother. I didn't know as a woman who could pass for white. Mm -hmm. I knew as my grandma. Okay. You know, and um, that's how that's how uh, that happened. 
Uh, you mentioned in passing Garveyite, and there was a nice, you know, acknowledgement from the audience because we know you're, um, of who you're speaking. But uh, could you speak a little bit about what his legacy meant and how you became aware of what Marcus Garvey had done and how it, how you felt as part of your, where you came, where your family came from, et cetera? Well, again, that was on my mother's side with my grandfather, who I obviously, <coughs> unfortunately, didn't get to know. Right. But uh, one thing that I think kind of is handed down through the genes, whatever, mm -hmm. is that I love my people. Okay. I love what we stood for, I love what we had accomplished, I love what we had contributed to civilization. And um, in that aspect of, of having that kind of pride, the only thing I look for is for us to really, as a people, really declare our greatness. Mm -hmm. Not from the standpoint of, of, of trying to be superior, anyway, but just what is. Right. What would happen, you know, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like, um, you know, George Washington Carver sent an email to to Louis Latimer or sent an email to someone else and said, we're going to corner the market of all the conventions. Okay, it didn't happen like that. They did what had to be done. And you look at the list of inventions that we all uh, appreciate and need. I learned, I learned this actually in 75 on Like It Is with Gil Noble. That 99% of everything you use in the kitchen was invented by a black man. Let alone go outside you house. You see, so that greatness in of itself is something that really has stayed with me. And recently, if I may say, some it's not the with the music, but somehow it does come out in my music. There was a recent NACP funeral for the N-word. Yes. I would like a funeral for the word minority. A word that's not a quote unquote curse word, but when you say that, you might as well call me the N word. Mm -hmm. See, because what does that mean? Dictionary, less than. When you're minor, you're less than. Yes, absolutely. You see, so I'd like to see a funeral for that word. I think that day they also buried the, the B and the H words, yeah. which are also part of the rap, rap vocabulary. But as long as, as long as you've taken us to, to this sp sp specific place, before we get back with your biography in chronological terms, which I, I can't wait to hear about, um, one would be, there was a panel discussion not that long ago at the Schomburg Library. Uh, I, th I think it was just last weekend or a couple of weekends ago. And it's on C-SPAN, for those of you that have a computer and like to watch these things on C-SPAN, you can watch the whole thing. So I watched the panel, it was a panel with a bunch of people including Paul Robeson Jr. who's been our guest here. And, and he was talking about how, you know, one way, one of the many ways that this country has to surmount its racial problems is that, you know, if you look at the, let's say the Caucasian group of people, they break it down to these are the Irish people, and these are the Jewish people, and these are the people from here, and these are the people from Scandinavia. However, when they come to representing the African American population, they represent it as one solid block. And specifically, I'm thinking about your background. Uh, your family comes from Montserrat and from other places. Oh, yes. Right. So consequently, uh, I guess it's the same issue when people talk about Barack Obama. And then you know, there, there have been some of these articles by various people who are saying, well, you know, yes, yes he's, he's a, a black candidate, but he's not an African-American candidate in the sense that he doesn't share the Southern background speaking to so now this is a long complicated argument I'm not getting on either side of it but my question to you is because you mentioned it is how did you as a young person growing up here and you're from Harlem um, fit into did, did you did you feel that your own particular background was somehow morphed into the people would assume that because you're African American that you sh share this southern Amer slave background in mm -hmm. culture and your culture is something different to be proud of and, and very very different exactly I think because <clears throat> it didn't come in a conversation because growing up, it's a thing where you know we saw the the uh, the similarity because in Harlem, of course, mostly all black folks. But right. we didn't get down to well, you're uh, you're black from Montreal or black from West Indies, West Indies or black from Atlanta, or whatever. It's just that we had that camaraderie already. Okay, and hanging on the corner was more listening to someone do some doo wop right. behind on the, on the, on the uh, traffic light. And um, now I remember being at a, a uh, an event at the Williamsburg uh, Theater in uh, 
from Brooklyn, uh, headed by uh, Gary, Jerry Eastman. And there were some young people doing some rap under a traffic light. And even though they weren't singing, it brought me back. The difference was that the cops came and dispersed them. Because they were supposedly, you know, causing a problem. Just, just recently? This was just about like last year. Got it. Although more recently you have Not Giuliani time, but yeah, this right. time. Right. But you have um, more recently a uh, situation with the drummers at uh, Marcus Garvey. Please, who, who please talk about been, that, please. Who have been drumming, which I, I like, my wife said, I mean, she never thought of it like that, but to me it was like Congo Square. Yes, yes. You see, you know, where they're taking away the drums. Okay, and they've been doing it for 30 years. Can you back up a little bit? And what happened exactly for those that What that happened is that um, for 30 years, a group of drummers have been drumming at Marcus Garvey Park, which originally was called Mark Morris Park, and been doing it for 30 years. And the area has been inhabited by folks who are not from home. Now all of a sudden, there's a problem that these drummers are too loud and they're upsetting their watching whatever American Idol, whatever show they're watching that night. And the cops came to disperse these drummers and the drummers said, no, we've been here for 30 years and we're gonna play until nine o'clock. So when they didn't move and there's no violence, they called for backup. Mm. These are young people, well, these are people who not having guns, they're doing music, okay? Bringing spirit and the, the essence of the homeland into Harlem, and they're being dispersed because folks don't feel it. Okay, and uh, so now there's 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 this big controversy. Oh. To me, it's no controversy. Okay, and the thing is that um, the folks who have a problem need to be to get out the house and listen to this music, because because the essence of Harlem cannot change mm -hmm. just based on people moving in. Okay, the spirit of the community is there, is delayed. The people have gone and died, their spirits are not gone. Their spirits are in home. So these folks gotta get used to it. What's happening, when they come into home, they gotta deal with what's in home and what has been there for years. Some of these people are very young, so before they were born, you see, or when they were babies. And these new people in Harlem don't belong to any particular race, ethnic group, age. They're all different stripes. And, you know, and some people, frankly, who, for whom this expression just may be something that, 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 that they're not comfortable with, like you mentioned, because they just don't know. But a large part of these, you know, if you look at the demographics of, who, of who's moving to Harlem, it really is kind of like a, uh, a rainbow kind of picture. I mean, there's all different kinds of people moving up here. And what's interesting is that if these same people, okay, for sake of art, I might, be, I might be wrong. But these same people took a trip to Senegal or took a trip <laughs> to Kenya. And, and they heard the same thing. <laughs> 12 midnight. They'd love it. They come, oh, it's so great. Oh, it's so great. So how come all of a sudden it ain't great no more? <laughs> you know what? I don't think that the issue could be better answered than just that. That's exactly what it is. They chose to move to a community. And then when they choose to buy it and choose to spend the money, then they want to redefine what the community is. Yeah. Excuse me, the community has been here for a long time and defined what it was. Exactly. I like to see them come out their hotel yes. in yeah. Senegal and come to people stop drumming. Mm -hmm. Okay? See how far they get. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> you know what's so funny? I, I heard somebody talking about just on a, on a similar note. They, they talk about when you're in a hotel sometimes and they charge an extra $150 to have a, a room at the hotel that faces the ocean. Mm. You know, it's free to swim in the ocean. Yeah. But to look at it from the room, <laughs> you're gonna pay an extra $100. I mean, people are crazy. But let me take this back to your story. And I mean, the, not back to your story, because that's part of your story too. But to take it back to you growing up here, uh, any brothers or sisters? Uh, I had an older brother. He passed away in 2001 from complications from diabetes. Mm -hmm. So his diabetes was part of me knowing him my whole life with that condition. I have, I have an older sister who lives in Canada. May I have their names, please? Uh, Linda and Calvin, although he hated that name. <laughs> so he called himself, because his middle name was Nicholas. You know, well, his middle name was Nichols, like my father. Right. But he hated Nichols, so he put the A in there to make it Nicholas. And then he hated Calvin, so he'd always sign it, C. Nicholas Gumbs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
But um, my sister was funny because you think of what a 16 year old listens to now. Right. Okay, at 16, my sister's record collection consisted of, and she was not a musician, Igor Stravinsky, Robert Streisand, Sonny Rollins, Lorenzo Alexandria, the Bond Jazz Quartet, Johnny Pacheco. Is she single? <laughs> I'd like to meet a girl like that. Are you at 16? At 16. That's what was in her collection. And um, so she had a lot of influence on me, but one of the people that had a profound influence on me, which is very, might find very interesting, because I was in the TV, eight years old. And once I finished my homework, I was watching TV. Was a TV show, two TV shows. One was called Peter Gunn, and one was called Mr. Lucky. Oh, yeah. Great music. And both shows were directed by Blake Edwards, and both shows were scored by Henry Mancini. And uh, when that bass line came up on Peter Gunn, I was done. You know, that was, that was, and what would be so hip is that, you know, the bass line would be the same, but it always, depending on the scene, the orchestration would be different. But the bass line would be totally the same, but he would find something always different to put on top of that bass line. And um, now mind you, through all this getting to music, which I started when I was seven years old, I had another love in my back pocket, which was designing cars. Hmm. Yeah, from when I was three years old, I mentioned I was at 2101, actually that's the address, 2101 Madison Avenue. I go up on the roof and like four or five years old, it was 14 floors, so I go up to the roof. I can name every car on the street at four years old. Hmm. Every single car that's parked on the street, I can name them. And I was going to the auto show and started designing cars. Even when I got to music in our high school, and after I had already taken years of piano, I still wouldn't design cars. So my parents took me to Detroit. My father was happy because he was into like nine to five because my father was a cop, you know, and, um, May I just ask a question just right there, because my, my next question was going to be, can you give us a sketch of Nichols Gums? We'd like to know, uh, we'd oh, like you yeah. to... My father was, um, was said he was in World War II, and uh, he was a policeman in Harlem. And one thing he told me, which I'm very proud to hear, he went the whole, the whole, uh, did the whole tour. Mm -hmm until um, he retired. And he told me that, one, he never took his gun out of his holster. Mm. He never shot anybody in his entire life by being a cop. And one thing about him is that he always believed in justice. And one of the people that he loved was Malcolm X. When he heard Ma Malcolm X tear into Mike Wallace, oh, he was happy. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was a happy camera. And see, we see it on the movie, but I saw it there yeah, when I saw Malcolm talking to Mike Wallace. And my father was always believed in justice. You know, even if a young man got arrested and uh, he saw the young man didn't know his rights, didn't know he could call his grandmother, he wrote to the young man said, you know, where he lived and all this kind of stuff. And then the other cops mm -hmm. would say, well, Gums, what you doing? Tell him what his rights are. They didn't like that. So consequently, he'd be penalized. He would never get promoted. Hmm. You see, because um, he just maybe cared too much. And one thing was kind of interesting that he did a job that was dangerous, and he had different hours because cops go from twelve to eight, eight to four, or four to eight, uh, twelve to eight, twelve to eight, four to twelve, and eight to four. Mm -hmm. But I always knew he was coming home. I didn't know what he was going into when he left the house. Mm -hmm. But I knew he was going to be coming home. And it's something my mother never worried about. And I never worried. We never worried about getting a call at some point. You know, he's going to work. He just had to be a guy that carries a gun and potentially could get shot at or him shoot somebody else. But those stories never came home. You know, we never had those stories. He never came home devastated about some incident other than. The more devastated, he was more devastated about his treatment by his other fellow cops mm -hmm. than dealing with the public. Where was his precinct? 
<laughs> now again, explain to me what what did that response just 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 mean? Y'all know. <laughs> but tell me, because because. Well, can you explain to folks who may who might not know watching this what that meant at that time, please? Oh, it is meant. It was a rough neighborhood. Is what you said. Rough neighborhood and the discrimination against the black cops from the white cops. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was a rough way to go. Right. You know, and uh, but he hung in there. But then what happened? We did in '57. We did the migration to Queens because what happened? A young lady. I think my father knew, or knew the family, she got murdered across the street. And uh, I remember looking from the window and seeing the body covered over. Mm. And um, he said it was time to go. And then one situation happened that uh, my brother was in the bedroom and he saw a body fall from the roof in front of him. So, my father said, okay, time to go. <laughs> time to get out of Dodge. Right. So we moved to, moved to Queens, and I felt kind of good because I felt like I picked a house because we went to different houses. Right. I said, I like this one. You know, so we ended up getting that house. Right, right, right. And uh, once we moved in, then my mother, in her wisdom, felt that I should take lessons because she got a hint when I was three years old because I used to walk around the house, could never finish a whole sentence, but I could sing Eddie Fisher's Oh My Papa. <laughs> Every lyric, straight down. So by the time we moved, we felt, she felt when I were in a different neighborhood, a different situation, I think we should, you know, improve and get into what she felt was my um, inclination towards music. Uh, in the same way that you did so beautifully with your father, could you introduce us to your mother and tell us about her? <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. I think that that kind of, that kind of answers it in a way. Mm. Well, she loved the music. You know, she always sang around the house. And um, when I came, I always come home from school and I go to practice. Because I started when I was seven years old. And my teacher would give me music. And, and somehow, I don't know when it started, but I started this whole thing when I got into jazz. I found myself like improvising on my lesson. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do something by Chopin, turn into a jazz wall, something like that, you know. <laughs> it was, and I wouldn't really re practice my lesson until like the day before my lesson, you right. know. So I'd be at the piano, and my mother would be in the kitchen, and she'd come and say, play Canadian Sunset, or play this tune, play that tune. And so while I'm playing, and she's just washing the dishes and everything, and singing along with me from the, from the, uh, from the kitchen. Uh. And she would sing, and I remember telling her, when you stop singing, that's when I'm going to worry about you. Because mm. she always sang, and she would have these tunes, I don't know what she sang. I had no idea what the song was, but she had her own little melodies and stuff like that. Right. And uh, she liked poetry, mm -hmm. so she would write little poems. And one time, I, I don't remember the full song, but uh, she wrote a poem, and I said it's music. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. And um, that's how my teacher who wasn't the greatest pianist, but was very motivating in that she encouraged composition, even though she really didn't teach composition. Yep. Every Christmas she would put like four or five cards on the piano and say, pick a card that you like. So I pick a card I liked. It's happened every year. Then I open it up, I read the, um, Inscription. the poem. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay, set to music. Write mm. music. Mm. I'm used to this. Every year I'd be writing a piece of music, and more and more I started to get into composition. What was the teacher's name? Her name was uh, May Tolland. T O L L O A N D. Mm -hmm. She was also the choir director for the church that like two blocks away from the house. Is this in Queens? In Queens, St. Albans, Queens. St. Albans? Yes, yeah, St. Albans. So, um, so I was in the choir. Of course, it got to a point where my father felt that 
this music thing, I don't know, you're going to have to drop something. So he made me drop the choir. So I couldn't think. So all this time I thought that he really didn't like music, didn't like me being in music, because he wanted, he wanted me to be a cop, too. Yeah. Or do something like when we went to Detroit to look at GM and Ford and Chrysler, he told me to be discarded on the thing I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Something will bring a paycheck <laughs> every week. So, you know, that, that's what his, you know, right. a normal job. You know, the word layoff wasn't part of his vocabulary, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, I dropped out the choir. What but, I'm sorry, what church? It was called um, Grace Methodist Church. Now it's called Grace United Methodist Church. And what was really hip is that we had a minister. And unfortunately, the Methodist Church has a, has a tradition that the minister is moved every four years to another church. Well, there was one year, and this minister was white, and by that time, most of the congregation was black. But one year, he brought Frank Foster into the church. Hmm. And have any of you seen um, Color Purple? Yeah. You know the three church ladies? We had them in our church. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they were like too happy with, he was, he was cool though, he was smart. He did the church service in the afternoon. He didn't do it as far as the regular church service. But he brought Frank Foster in and had a man. And I remember the singer that did um, <coughs> Monday Blues. And uh, the woman just sitting there like, yeah, what, a, like what a face. <laughs> Sour face. You know, but it was, it was really cool, you know. Then he left. And it was like, wow, it's a drag. Because he really was cool, very cool about stuff. And uh, also, as a, as a youngster, you know, I mean, now I, I, I through Buster Williams and Herbie, I got into Buddhism. But at that time, going to church, there was such a community atmosphere. There was such a aspect of looking out for the young people and having young people having somewhere to go. The church was an active center. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just Sunday. Right. It might have been Monday, it might be Wednesday, it might be Tuesday. We had somewhere to go. And we had uh, counselors mm -hmm. who would be there for us. And we did, and we did um, uh, activities. Had parties, had something, had African night or whatever. But, but it was something where we knew we had somewhere to go. And the church wasn't just something we went to on Sunday and stayed there to do a sermon. Right. It made it very active, made it very real mm -hmm. for us. And uh, we had a unity. If someone came to try to upset the unity, they knew they had to go. They weren't getting in. And nothing went down where they tried to force themselves into the church. They knew that if they weren't going to act right, if they wanted to come in, they had to act right. Mm -hmm. And that's just acting with respect. Mm -hmm. So that was a different kind of time. Even even um, crashing parties was a whole different thing back then. Because you can go to a party, don't know the people, don't know who's there, and mom right there, how do you know, come on in, come in, they're downstairs. So, don't know who she is, don't know who owns the house. I stayed there for a little while, maybe have some punch, then say, you ready to go? Okay, it was me. No problems, right. nothing, you know, it was just a different time, you know, right. when I grew up as a teenager in, in Queens. But, um, how, okay. No, 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 no. I, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you. How was it that how was it that jazz came into your life? As I, as I said before, with apart uh, from listening to my sister's music, right, and the influence of Henry Mancini. I have to be very honest with that. The, the influence of Henry Mancini's music, because I became like a Henry Mancini groupie. I mean. I went to I went to a John Wayne movie. I mean, I don't like John Wayne <laughs> at all. I do. But, but there was a movie he did called Atari that Mancini had this outrageous score, and he went he did his homework because there's a piece on the on the soundtrack called The Sounds of Atari because the movie's about capturing animals for the zoo. How they actually, you know, you see animals in the zoo, so how they get there. What this movie is about, how they actually go to the continent and wherever, and the process of capturing these animals. Mm. And the big animal in this film, the big nemesis, was the rhino. So uh, Mancini wrote a piece, and he had the use of a lot of drums. It wasn't like hearing a Gene Cooper 
interpretation of African music. He used real African drummers in the soundtrack. And it wasn't even until the 70s when I saw this door from the fire and Maurice White was doing the kalimba, that I realized like 12 years earlier that Mancini was using the kalimba in the soundtrack and was using bilophones in the soundtrack. Mm. And I said, wow. And it's something where there's no personnel listing. He just felt it was important for this piece to have it. And when you hear it, you don't think a brother wrote the piece, you know, because mm -hmm. but because the thing is also interesting in recent years, we realized that Peter Gunn was the same year as Kind of Blue. Mm -hmm. You see, and so his contribution to cool jazz and everything is no less important mm -hmm. because um, he learned a lot from a guy named Claude Thornhill. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that had a big influence on his writing. Right. But um, I, 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 I just want to mention that one of our other. Harlem Speaks guest Joe Wilder, who many of you remember, uh, made a record back then of the music from Peter Gunn. Yes. So we have a lot of, a lot of nice synergies here, you know, yes, that there are a lot of people. Yes. And I think Benny Carter was one of the ghost writers and one of the writers for that show, I think, who also okay. wrote some okay. things. Right. And the thing is, I became a groupie because um, at an early age, I really enjoyed looking at a movie filmed in Manhattan. There's something about seeing Manhattan on the screen. And the first movie I saw of that was Brexit Tiffany's. Which is crazy because I was 11 years old and I understood everything was going on in that movie. <laughs> At 11. But it was listening to his music and listening to his melodies that grabbed hold of me of how what, important. Was Moon River from that show? Moon River was from that movie. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, funny how, you know, again, as a musician, when musicians really believe in their music, and important to what it does for a film or for a movie for a record. Because um, a sidebar with that particular movie, some may or not may or may not may or may not know, the RG Hepburn, how many saw the movie Brexit Tiffany's? The scene where RG Hepburn sings in the window was not supposed to be in the movie. Mm -hmm. And Harry Man Cini fought for her to sing in that movie and have that scene. You know, because they thought she couldn't sing or something, but it was like her spirit of bringing that song was what he felt. And as a composer who's worked with some of the best singers in the world, he still felt that, oh, no, 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 we need to leave that in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, again, the whole thing of melody is something that, for me in recent years, has bothered me mm -hmm. as far as many young jazz artists who forego melody mm -hmm. for technique and uh, performance. But I was very happily, uh, happily discovered uh, a song written by a very fine young trumpet player named Sean Jones. How many of you have MySpace? Okay. It's a website this that you can you find. You can't own website. Well, even if you don't have MySpace, you can go to uh, myspace.com slash Sean Jones Jazz. He has a piece on there called Allison. And it renewed my spirit of what was missing with a lot of players. Because I sat there and just started listening to his music. And this one piece, there's not a lot of improvisation, but the melody is so probing is so beautiful and the, and the and the treatment of the arrangement and i wrote him and said that uh i really love this piece mm -hmm. and i made no mention of melody or why i loved it just that i loved it he said well you know you guys didn't talk me about the points of melody so he said to me i hadn't mentioned melody in my talk to him he said well you guys told me how important melody is and that's exactly why I like the song. Oh, that's beautiful, man. You know, so it's a song, because it's a song I told him, if people listened to this music, the world would be in a better place. Mm -hmm. That's why I really urge you to really check this song out at his MySpace, because that's what music is about. You know, and uh, we had gotten to a little earlier, the um, whole thing of my relationship with jazz, and for a music that is so misunderstood, jazz is the closest thing to human conversation. 
I say that because the essence of the jazz is what? What's the essence of the jazz? Improvisation. Improvisation. Now, when we talk to each other, we make up as we go along. We don't have scripts when we talk to each other. So what we do, we trade for us as we talk. <laughs> so human conversation is jazz. Because human conversation is comprised of going, making up as you go along. And there may be a theme, because you have a topic to talk about. But we have what we feel about that theme to come out of our heads at, at, at that point of it leaving our lips into the air, you see. And, uh, and once it's gone, it's out, it's gone, yeah. you see. So it's a music that I think, to be least understood, is the closest to the earth and closest to what we're about as people. Because the thing is that for me, I mean, people may disagree, is that we started concentrating on us too much. The the critics and everything started concentrating on what Miles was playing, what Train was playing, and what, what Herbie's playing. What, it's about, no, it's about what do you feel for what they're playing? What do you get from that performance? Because our thing is to touch you. It's for you to find that place in your life that, that relates to what he's saying. It could be beautiful, it could be tragic. It could be hard, it could be simple. But we play, because if it wasn't about you, then we could stay in the basement or the rehearsal hall and play to with heart's content. But we get in front of an audience, so hopefully the audience will feel something for what we play. Right. It's not about, well, the second verse, the second tune, the third verse of this last set. What are you thinking about? I guarantee you, every one of those cats will say, I don't know. <laughs> what are you asking me that for? I'm trying to find a bank every third time to make the last train back to back home, you know? I hear you. You know, we have to play till to 2 o'clock. Right. Like, well, I don't know. You know, we may have an understanding of the overall impression of what we're trying to put out there, mm -hmm. but to pin us to say, well, that chord you played, what was it? Hey, it came up, like language, you know? Let me get back to my script for a second. Uh, uh, what, uh, to go back to when, how did jazz come into your actually playing the piano? Now, you mentioned li listening to Peter Gunn and, and, and Henry Mancini and all this. Yes. So you're born in 49. So let's say you're 15, 16, however old this is, the early 60s, mid, mid 60s. Um, how did you actually start playing it on the piano? How, d did you have jazz well, friends? First, no, I didn't. I mean, my first adventure into playing jazz because outside here in Mancini, that was the only jazz record I know, the, okay. the, the soundtracks. Then I discovered Horace Silver. Ah, okay. And my first real, like I said, my first real Blue Note record was Tokyo Blues. And what I would do is because, you know, Horace first was a great composer. Right. Uh, but no disrespect to Horace, he wasn't an Oscar Peterson at the piano. You know, he wasn't like he played, you know, lightning fast riffs. So, at like 13, 14 years old, I was able to follow him and play his solos along with him. Right. And that's what I would do. I would I would play solos with Horace Silver. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was also going to music in our high school uh, in Manhattan, when it was still uptown in, in Harlem. And I met some great musicians there. Uh, some of my classmates included uh, Lou Matthews. Well, if you don't know who Al Matthews is, he's now the music director for Nancy Wilson. Um, Jerry Gonzalez and Andy Gonzalez, who played in a band together. Mm -hmm. It was fashioned after a fashioned after a uh, the sound of Cal Jada, because the leader of the band was a vibraphonist named Andrew Langston. So uh, Jerry with the conga, and Andy was the bass, and we had a timbali player. So I also was an upperclassman named Jerry Thomas, who also was late of uh, the Pat Back Band and uh, Jimmy Castor Bunch. And then there was a another pianist, was on there, I haven't mentioned his name in a long time, so I can't remember it, but we used to do forehand piano. Okay, and his thing was, he was good with, <coughs> Um, playing uh, 
solos. And I was good with reharmonization. Mm -hmm. So we had this little thing going on where, since I was good with the harmonies, he, we open a tune, we play the head, right? The, 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 the melody, I play the melody. Mm -hmm. He played, you know, the bass line of the chords. Then when he gets to solos, we switch places. Right. At the piano while we're playing. So I pick up, get up, and then walk down the piano, sit down again. Oh. He goes the other side. We continue, and we open up the, uh, the song. And one of the songs that we did was a song written by Neil Hefty called Bathtub Saturday Night. You know, it was kind of hokey too. That's how it sounded, but then we like open it up and be like, you know, great. And one of the other, two of the other um, classmates was, was um, Wilbur Bascom, oh. whose father, Doug Bascom, was one of the great uh, trumpet players. And he was an incredible bass player. And they had a, another guy named Bela, Hor Bela Horvath. I'm not sure what happened to him, but Bela and Wilbur had like the Oscar Peters and Ray Brown thing going on. So they would do duo stuff at the, at the school. And in addition to that, another classmate wanted me to meet his father, because they lived down the street from the high school. And his name was Leroy Kirkland. Oh, yes. And Leroy is the composer of Cloudburst. Right. Those are done by Manhattan Transfer and New York Voices and Pointer Sisters. He also was the arranger producer of the Ruben Romantics hit, Our Day Will Come. So I say this to say is that in recent years, uh, at least the last 20 some odd years, I've been pigeonholed as being this or being that, or being a smooth jazz player or being that kind of player. The thing is, growing up, you know, going back to my sister, I had a very eclectic sure. upbringing. Sure. As a listener and as a performer. Mm -hmm. So you have a person by the time you get to high school who's being mentored by an R&B uh, producer, who's playing in a Latin jazz quintet, who's playing with the big band, who's doing two four-hand piano, you see, and still taking classical lessons. Huh. You see, so uh, I see music as music. Even before I knew you could call it jazz, mm -hmm. okay, I just loved what I heard, you see, and... Um, I feel that if you feel, it's like we don't eat the same food every day. Okay, yeah. You see, we have different meals we like to have. You know, and so we have different rhythms that we kind of relate to. Hmm. And I say, hey, tonight I feel like so-and-so. Mm -hmm. I eat that. So today I feel like some funk. Mm -hmm. Today I feel like some straight ahead. Today I feel like some Brazilian. Because, you know, I feel some classical. Because when I do a performance, you hear some funk in my straight ahead, you hear some straight ahead in my funk. <laughs> you see? Because it's about what happens at that point. But the whole thing is about not me. Sure, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, but the whole emphasis is about you, the audience, that you come away with something. You know, I remember once I was visiting somewhere and they, they served for dinner something they called the Mongolian pot. And what it was was you had, first you had some chicken, they put the chicken in the dish, then they took the chicken out, then, then you had some fish, and after the fish, then you had some meat, and after the fish, you had some, some vegetables. And at the end of the thing, you're supposed to drink the liquid that's in the bottom because it mixed it all up, and the way that you're talking about your music sounds to me like either a Mongolian pot or like a dish of a whole bunch of different beautiful tasting things, and in the center of the plate, they all kind of run together. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to, you know, that spinach tastes better because it's in the fish. And the fish tastes a little bit better because it's next to this and next to that. I and mean, the way you're presenting it, it just sounds like yeah. a very natural mixing. And I think a lot of people probably limit themselves because they only listen to, I mean, exactly. I was that kind of person. And you try to deal with this too much. And not, and not this. Yeah. You know, I went to a, uh, there's also, I mentioned West Indian, there's also uh, Jamaican Indians. I have an extended family. Uh, based on my grandfather on the mother's side, I also have Santo Domingo hmm. relatives. Okay, so uh, again, that's another kind of mix. But the thing is that I was at a gathering the other day, and um, one of the guests brought something from this place. I can't remember what it is now. The, the, the place was in Secaucus, New Jersey. And it was a dish called Bam Bam Shrimp. And my wife doesn't like shrimp. 
Okay, so stuff bounces around too much in the mouth. <laughs> Here you go. Let it go. So she landed the shrimp. The spud, Start the shrimp. She, I took a bite of this, and I said, you've got to try this. Now, what we liked about it had nothing to do with this. It had to do with, like, when your taste buds start ringing, you don't care what's in it. Like, <laughs> like right now? <laughs> when you taste something that's, like, really, like, happening, you may find out what's in it, but that's only a matter of information. Got it. Your heart and your life already has they've computed, oh, I like this, I want some more. Music the same way. You hit a certain chord, you don't know why you like it, but you know, there's a tune by Earth and the Fire called Imagination. And the chorus, I think it's Verde playing bass, though they say it might be somebody else playing bass, but there's a bass, there's a bass thing. A bass, uh, a bass note they hit that it's like wow. It's like I go to another level every time I hear it, and then the the tag out. You know, everyone says that that reasons was Philip Bailey's best performance because what he does at the end. I disagree. <laughs> when you hear his out on imagination. He sings like his life is depending on it. Okay, it's like when I hear "Living for the City," Stevie, and if you listen to the song, okay, and there's a little skit in the middle, and the young man is gone. He came, comes to maybe Chicago or New York, and he's just you know gathered for the first time. He's all in wonderment, and this cat runs up on him and tells him to hold his back. Next you know he's in jail. And you hear the door slam. You listen to Stevie's voice after it slams. It's raspy. The brother is angry. There's a brother who's blind. But the brother is angry. He wants to kill somebody. He wants to say, this is not right. Okay, and it this this makes no sense. This is you know when is it when is the madness going to stop? You see, so he's speaking to us in a way of taking taking some some uh, some some uh, uh, effort because to me, even as a jazz musician, you know I'll say right, Stevie Wonder is one of the greatest yes. musicians mm -hmm. on this planet, mm -hmm. and he's not been given his due. It's I don't true. Care about the Beatles. Mm -hmm. He was okay. <laughs> Bob Dylan, I don't know about it all. <laughs> Stevie Wonder mm -hmm. is one of the greatest musicians, singers, writers mm -hmm. that we have on this planet. Okay. And all the respect, all the respect to Duke Ellington. Billy Strayhorn is one of the greatest composers that we have out here, had out here. And, um, I feel that we as a people need to recognize the greatness that we brought to this planet on so many different levels. Okay, yes, you have a Joe Lovato, you have, uh, you had Bill Evans a pianist, Bill Evans a saxophone player, you have Fred Hirsch, you have all these great writers and musicians. Oh, these are white people that you're talking about. These are white people that right. you're talking about. Right. But, no different if I play, compose a piece in the spirit of Mozart, or play a, or play a, uh, a, uh, 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 Koto, play Koto, Japanese instrument, okay? What I play is not black music, okay? If I play a Mozart piece, the piece is not black music because I'm a black musician. If I write in the spirit, I write a, 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 a symphony in the spirit of Wagner. It's not black music. It's white European music written by a black man. So no different when Joe Lovano puts it to us and Fred Hirsch and Bill Shaw. All those very great music, they are playing black music. Music came out of the black community. So then what's Leontine Price doing when she's singing opera? She's singing European classical music. So then as she's a black right. artist so singing then, European classical music. Right, but 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 my question is not I mean to 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 be to be argumentative about it. Yeah. But 
is what we're saying is that art and art music, that the thing that makes art art is that it belongs to everyone and that consequently no one would want to say that Leontine Price is in some way a second-class opera singer. No. And in the same way that, would, that, that we wouldn't want to say that a white musician, or, or I mean, because that's how you've defined it, that somehow that, that, that there's something that's, that's not true or honest or no, of the idiom. Again, I bring food back into it. I bring food back into it. Right. OK, you say rice, OK? You make black eyed peas and rice, what's uh huh. You make chicken fried rice, it's Chinese. The rice is still the same. <laughs> so what's the, the, music, the rice? The rice, so, rice so, the so wait, 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 wait a second. So the rice, the rice is the music. No, 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 no. The, 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 what I'm saying is that I'm hungry. That, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the spirit, the spirit of bam, jazz, bam, shrimp, and now this. The spirit, the spirit of jazz. Yes. Is coming out of the black community. Of course it is. Oh, yeah. Okay, but it, it belongs to everybody. Everybody can enjoy fried rice. Right. Everyone can enjoy it, but they understand where it comes from. Okay, and the spirit of, in other words, I say that from the standpoint that there's been an argument that, that jazz is European harmonies with African rhythms. Much too simple a definition. Yeah, but that's been, but in other words, the origin is that. But it's not, it's not the harmonies. So it was done with the harmonies. You see, so, yes, so you can say the harmonies, or, uh, and the thing is that they also try to note that Africa didn't have any harmonies. But listen to a group like Lady Smith, okay, you hear rich harmonies. When I went to Senegal, I saw a violin in, in one of the museums. Right. You see, so the thing is, is that the, what makes jazz what it is, okay, is understanding its origin. Not Absolutely. understanding just where it's come to, but understanding its origin. Absolutely. Okay, and that's all that I feel needs to be, because no one has a problem when you talk about R&B. Okay, no you have Robin Thicke and Justin Timberlake. Everyone knows R&B is black music. Okay, if you have gospel, okay, you're not going to try to go up against Shirley Caesar. And try to say, well, you have somebody come and say, well, the, the, no, the origins are in the black church, regardless of who sings it. Sure, but, but, and, and so the operative word, I guess, here is origins. Origins. And yes. so, you know, for instance, I'm just curious, like your reaction to this. What I say to to my young students is, you know, regardless of where you're from, and you know, there's a whole bunch of people who think now that you know, jazz in America is dead anyway, and all the new stuff is happening in Europe, you know, which is just a whole other question. But, but. What I tell them is, uh, I'm just reporting on what people say. I, I don't, you know. yeah. but but some, what I say is when, when you play jazz music, whether you know it or not, you know you're one foot in a church somewhere, mm -hmm. and you're one foot in a church because you can look in Africa till you're blue in the face, and you could look in Europe till you're blue in the face, and you're not, you were not going to find what was jazz music, that the jazz music as it came together happened here. And I think that if you went back in history days and just put like a, a Geiger count on it and you say, where do we first encounter this feeling? It would be in the black churches of the, of the South back in the, in the 19th century where all this stuff came together. And the jazz music is nothing but what they label jazz music. You see, and this is what's interesting about what you're saying, because what I'm really hearing and what you're saying is to try and get away from these labels exactly. and just say, you know, this is an African-American idiom of music that the whole world responded to. And why try and kid yourself? Exactly. Yeah. The thing is also, uh, when we talk about the origins of music and what we enjoy now, we take for granted a John Coltrane, a Whit Marcellus, a Woody Shaw, you know, a Naja Alexander's, or Bill Evans. We take for granted uh, Pat LaBelle and Leontine Price, or uh, Mahalia Jackson, or Paul Robeson, or Miles Davis. And then we talk about slavery, we get real quiet and get like kind of, ooh, ooh. But if we believe that everything happens for a reason, mm -hmm. okay, it could be conjecture, but would we have found Miles Davis in Senegal? Would we have found Herbie Hancock in Ghana? Mm. The conditions of this country mm -hmm. made way for the emergence of this music we call gospel, the music we call jazz.
Mm -hmm. You see, as far as to understand, we enjoy the music, but they also go to the origins of how it could even come about. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about slavery. We don't want to, don't want to look at roots, all that kind of thing. Yes, it's abominable. It's an abominable situation. But it happened. Yeah. But it happened. Right. And as a result of what happened, look at what we enjoy. There's still a lot of problems, but we would not be looking at a Shirley Caesar. We'd be looking at um, Aretha Franklin mm -hmm. or Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. was for slavery. Right. And at this point, and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt right here, but A, we have to change the videotape, and I don't want to lose a word of what you're saying because it's much too important. And it's also uh, that, that note, uh, we do this quite frequently. I'm very happy to share the bully pulpit up here with uh, the co-producer of Harlem Speaks and someone without whom the series would never have evolved the way it is, our good friend Greg Thomas, who's a wonderful interviewer and a writer in his own right. Greg? Thank you, Lauren. All right. Well, um, we're going to ask him just a few questions. Thank you. All right, so as I was saying, we're going to just ask a few questions, and then we're going to get you all involved by asking a few questions to make your comments about Mr. Onaji Allen. So, um, can you tell us about uh, your first professional gig? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, playing as a keyboard player, I did some work with, uh, I mentioned before, Mr. Leroy Kirkland, uh, and he had introduced me in the course of me working under his tutelage to uh, Ken Burrell. Fuck and I got on a sorry, man. You know, I went to a whole program of four years of playing, and I never was quite comfortable with me as a pianist. I was very comfortable with me as a composer and arranger. So what happened is that uh, after I got out of college, I had this other reel-to-reel tape. There was no such thing as a cassette tape or anything like that. We had reel-to-reel tape, seven-inch tapes that I got from the school of my various performances. What school? Uh, State University of New York at Fredonia. And I met Kenny, and through Mr. Kirkland, I wanted to give Kenny a, um, a tape that he might want to use for an upcoming album and some songs. So Kenny had a, had a club here many years ago called The Guitar on 10th Avenue. So I went to the club and I presented Kenny with the tape. And he said, I'll get back to you on Monday. Okay, okay. So I go back home and I'd gone out for the next day. It was like uh, Thursday. So I go out and um, I come home. My mother says, uh, Kenny Brown just called for you. So wait a minute. He said he's going to call me on Monday. This is only Thursday. Okay, so she said, yeah, he got the number. Here's the number right here. So I called him back, a little nervous, and I said, he said, you want a game? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it ended up being a gig in his hometown in Detroit at Baker's Keyboard Lounge. And the bass player was none other than Major Holly. And to tell you, the Detroit is, is, is a different place physically. But from a human standpoint, because I mean, the Jones Brothers from Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. The warmth and the nurturing and the taking care of you because I was my I was nervous because I'll get out doing a gig with Kenny Burrell and Major Holly unfortunately I can't remember the drummer's name but again all of them just gave me so much love they didn't try to kick my butt and try to you know whip me into shape but they just took care of me mm. all right and I felt very relaxed in that situation so that was my very first I'd say real professional on the road, you know, kind of gig was with Kenny Burrell in Detroit. Approximately what year was that? That was 71. In 71. And tell us, you know, in, in a summary fashion, some of the progressions that happened from there in terms of groups. Yeah, okay, what happened is that, um, during that time also I uh, had just got out of college. And of course the Vietnam War was going on very heavy. 
and I was just not into going. I mean, I said I felt like Muhammad Ali. You know, I ain't not going somewhere. They ain't doing nothing to me. You gonna tell me to kill somebody? I don't know these people. Okay, it's like what am I supposed to do? You know, I mean, you come up against me, my family. That's a different story. But I don't know these people. He asked me to go up there, just take them out. So what happened is that I didn't want to go to Canada, and I wasn't going to go to Ireland. So I applied for a conscience objector status. And I was in a band at that time, and one of the managers was actually on the draft board. <laughs> and it was not like he got me through, but uh, my father, as I mentioned before, was a World War II veteran and he was a policeman most of his life. And I said, I don't want to fight in the war. And he didn't agree with me, but he respected that I knew what I didn't want to do, and he supported me. He mm -hmm. went with me to the draft board interview. Mm -hmm. And something happened at that draft board interview that it was very hard for me because I think, you know, theory is one thing and reality is something else. They asked me a question, well, if someone went up against your, assaulted your mother, would you, would you do harm to them? <laughs> and what happened is that I broke down and cried because I knew I didn't want to fight in this war. And Simon said, no, I would kick this ass for him back, touch my mother. You know, there's two M's, you don't mess with my mother and my money. <laughs> so so I, I, I broke down because I knew my answer had to be no. But it was a conflict. Mm. I knew I was not going to this insane war. Mm. Actually, I wrote a whole thing, almost like a thesis about why I don't want to go to war. And they had to get um, references. So. Um, one reference was from a composer who went on to, uh, uh, Bill Salter, who went on to uh, write Mr. Magic and um, Where is the Love. He wrote a reference letter. And then um, Dr. Billy Taylor wrote a reference letter because during my college years, I actually wrote a piece for the David Frost Show that was aired uh, while I was still in college. So he wrote a reference letter. And I had come across it some years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and read it. And I was like, damn, Billy, what am Because what he said was, in essence, to make his, make his point, he said, he will be of no use to you. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, like, you don't want the man to sabotage a mission. <laughs> you don't want to kill people. So you really don't want him dead. He's like, I? I'm saying to myself, well, you know, good looking up, but damn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, so needs to say, uh, after all that, uh, usually you have to wait till a week or two weeks to find out the findings, but I found it that night because of my manager who was in, was in the, um, on the draft board, and I found that night I, I got it. I got to the it. And the thing is, I still have to go through the process because there are two things you have to do. If you're going to defer, they won't make it really hard for that. So you have to work in a nonprofit organization that's more than 50 miles away from your home. Usually, people end up in like crazy places. Crazy people. <laughs> so I ended up going to Buffalo because a friend of mine, because I met during my senior year in college, I go to Buffalo and met a whole bunch of musicians. Now, one musician you may know, his name is Joe Ford. He's worked with McCoy Tyner and other people. But um, there's another brother uh, named Sabu Adeola, who's a very fine bass player who's worked with Ahmad Jamal and other people. But he's still stationed in Buffalo. So they had a Model Cities program, like you met that, that term, Model Cities, which of course is, you know, something else anyway. But uh, there was a Model Cities program for an art center in Buffalo. And he asked me if I would come up to be one of the instructors. 
So it's like the DAO. So I'm just say nonprofit organization and 500 miles is definitely more than 50 miles. So I jumped at it right away and said, I'll take it. Of course, I was getting paid more than a private, but they didn't know that. And um, I stayed there for like six months before I got a reclassification because I guess they thought I was so eager to do my service that they gave me some brownie points or something. So after six months, I didn't have to, I, I was reclassified one Y. Okay, which means I didn't have to serve ever again in life. So my thing was, well, I'm making some money and I have nothing really definite back in New York, so I stayed in Buffalo, okay? And through that, my whole life just started changing. Because at that point, uh, after that, um, Herbie's been, I mean, everybody who was anybody. I mean, there was a club up there called the Revelot Lounge. The, the what? The Revelot. The Revelot. Revelot. Yeah. Okay. Like and Revelation? Like, like I think mean, R-E-V-I-L-O-T. Okay. Revelot Lounge. And it was like the Village Vanguard of Buffalo. Oh. Everybody who was anybody, they're on tour, they end up at the Revelot. And what was really kind of crazy is that, you know, most clubs like in New York, uh, like the Vanguard, you have like six days, like Tuesday through Sunday. Well, in Buffalo, there's still six days, but you come on Monday and off on Wednesday. And you got to play through Sunday. So you're still there seven days. Plus, you have to play a matinee on Sunday. And during the matinee, musicians in the audience could come and sit in with you. So you have, you have people like Freddie Hubbard, McCoy Tyner, Herbie Hancock, Eddie Harris, Rasan Roland Kirk, and you had a chance to sit in with these great musicians. And um, Herbie came up with the sex tech, it was like the Mwadishi group with Eddie Henderson and Benny Maupin and Julian Priester, Billy Hart, and uh, his sound man, who to me was like the sixth, seventh member of the group, his name was Flindy. And uh, Pharrell Sanders came in after Herbie. So Norman Connors was playing drums with her, with um, Pharrell Sanders. And he was kind of, not flamboyant, but he was like kind of out there as far as, you know, coming with the scarf around his neck and catting around. Pharrell or Norman? Norman. Okay. <laughs> 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 so he had just done an album called Dance of Magic. That had, you know, all these great cats on, on, on the uh, on the album. So he was walking around with at that time he said LP is called the Slick, which is the cover, the artwork before it gets actually on the cardboard to become the the, the LP cover. So he came into the club and um, he was looking for somebody to compose and arrange the title track of his next album and he wanted to have strings, and he wanted to be a Brazilian type tune. Well, Brazilian music was like one of the most incredible genres of music. And actually, I kind of slipped into it, fell into it, because see, when I would write tunes, I can have a keyboard walking bass line going while I'm trying to write the tunes. So then being be do 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 it's easy for me to go do 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 So all my tunes end up sound like Brazilian tunes, right? So, but then I met, the music of Sergio Mendes and then from there to other people. So I just fell in love with this music. So I started arranging for strings and horns while I was in college. So he hit the jackpot. He said, I want strings, I want Brazil. So I pat him on his shoulder and said, I'm your man. Okay, so I had those same tapes that I showed Kane Burrell. Mm -hmm. And we went to the center that was working and he listened to my music. And one thing about Norman that I really admired at then, which I would admire now, is that he had just met me, he heard my music, he didn't wait to go make a phone call to the producer, or wait till Monday to make a phone call to the record company. Right then and there, he commissioned me, just met, met me, knew me for maybe a couple hours. He commissioned me to compose and arrange the title track of his next album. 
And another thing that was incredible was that um, when I finally finished the arrangement, had it copied out, and went to the studio, his producer had freaked out before all this. Because the producer said, you meant who from where? <laughs> <laughs> Buffalo. But, but the thing is, as I mentioned, all the cast came through Buffalo. So by the time I got to the studio, everyone was in the band, which included Herbie Hancock, which included Buster Williams, which included A.E. Henderson, Gary Bartz, Carlos Garnett, Lawrence Killian. The vocals would be done by Dee Dee Bridgewater. Um, and, you know, so they all knew me. So this guy's in the control room. I'm trying to, again, I always like to be fly on the wall in situations like this. So I'm standing on the podium. This guy don't know me from Adam. All of a sudden, Herbie said, Hey, Nigel, what's up, man? What's up? What are you playing in Measure 5? No, what's it? And then Buzz, hey, uh, well, Nigel, man, what's it? So he said, Damn. Even my sister, who always called me Alan, <laughs> she would always call me Alan. She was there to take pictures. She comes up to the podium and says, Oh, Nigel. <laughs> you know, I guess something went in wrong. You know. <laughs> but what happened is that the producer was so impressed with the performance, he took me aside. His name was Skip Drinkwater. And don't laugh. Drinkwater. Drinkwater. That was his real name. Um, he took me aside and said, Do you have a publishing company? I said, No. Now, the two were like, 11 minutes long. So for somebody, if they got a nice airplay, for somebody to have publishing, a nice little taste, okay? I said, no, I don't have a publishing company. He said, start one. Oh, this music belongs to you. He could have very well have taken mm -hmm. it, mm. you see. But also, from then on, that was a lesson for me because even when I write with somebody, I said, do you have a publishing company? He said, no, well, you start one. Mm. Okay, well, more practically, it's less paperwork for me. Because then, if all the money comes to me, I gotta figure it out and send it out to this guy. Just, so you start your own public fund, collect your own money, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I never forgot that, I never forgot that. And I uh, ended up doing about five or six albums with Norman Connors. And um, one of the Two arrangements and, and that I really feel good about. And also, I worked with Norman, worked with some of the best singers in the business. I did, uh, I mentioned Dee Dee Bridgewater. Then I did an arrangement of a song, again, a Brazilian tune, um, Gingy, which featured Gene Kahn. And uh, the biggest tune of my tenure with Norman was the arrangement of uh, Bet You By Golly Wow, sung by Phyllis Hunt. And uh, and after that happened, I actually became Phyllis's musical director while she was at a club called McKell's up uh, oh, yes. well, downtown. Mm -hmm. And this was a great club because you heard all kinds of music coming. It was straight ahead, jazz, uh, contemporary jazz, uh, R&B, whatever. And uh, you didn't have to fight to get a gig at the club. And the club was like, were very, very um, lively. A lot of people came out to that club. And Woody Allen. Woody Allen. Yeah, Woody Allen, Paul Simon, the mm -hmm. whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I ended up being her arranger, I mean, uh, her music director, and also ended up doing three arrangements for our debut album on Buddha Records. And um, then the gig got canceled because she went on the road with Norman, which I told her not to do. But she did because, see, the record company had picked the tune to be a single because it featured a duet between her and Michael Henderson, who used to play bass for Miles Davis. But there was no male vocal in the band. And also, Norman didn't play the drums on that single. So they couldn't do the song. But they could have done Betcha My Guy Wow, but they took Phyllis on the road, and it didn't turn to be the best tour. Um, for her. But of course, the rest is history. She came back and really did some great things. And when that, that left, that was over with, I ended up going with uh, Nat Adderley uh, because Cannibal had died. And uh, my process of how I present myself 
in concert or in the club is really based on those two men, Campbell Adley and Nat Adley, because they felt it was important to really bring the people along for the ride. Don't leave them assuming they know what's going on, okay? Because if you notice, Cannibal's discography, at least at least 90% of his albums were live albums, mm. okay? And Nat was in the tradition of Cannibal of talking to the audience. So it stayed with me. And um, even though I wasn't ready I felt for me to lead a band, yeah. I knew those were, those were uh, situations and um, events that I learned from Cannibal and learned from playing with Nat that I wanted to remain part of my life if I ever decided to lead a band. So the band stayed together for a little while because what Nat did, he tried to really school us on how to, how to run a band. So his whole thing was, I tell you what, I'll take a third of the money. You get two thirds of the money, and you take care of all, all the all the particulars. Like you know, gotta get a band, gotta get this. He wanted to like whip, whip us into shape to prepare us to be our own leaders and our own bands. Well, that worked for a little while, but we got tired of that. <laughs> <laughs> so when that realized we didn't want to do that anymore, he, he disbanded the band because <laughs> it meant he had to take more charge, and he wasn't ready to do that. But the experience was was. Uh, it was a great, and we had two albums, one for Atlantic and one for Steeplechase. And also at that same point, I did a solo album for Steeplechase, which was pro totally improvisational because that would have a situation at the gig where I would do an improvised solo, but the song would sound like something I'd already written out because the consistency would last from the beginning. It would be an idea just came in my head but I would hold the idea in my head that I could carry it through the entire song. So it would sound like something that I wrote already, but it'd be something that you would hear for the very first, actually both of us would hear for the very first time on the stage. So the producer, Nils Winter, who ran Steeplechase, or does run Steeplechase, asked Nana, would I like to do a whole album like that, improvisatory music? So they asked me, so that's cool. It was kind of weird though, because that's 1976 and I've yet to receive a world royalty for that record. Solo piano. The studio maybe cost $500. But anyway, I did that. And uh, that was my first solo uh, recording. And when that disbanded, then a few months later, I was approached by probably, one, probably the last great trumpet player in this industry, named Woody Shaw. And uh, he, he saw me in a club, and he said, uh, you want to join my band? Want to join my band? I said, OK. Because I, I, I really admired Woody, because a few years before that, working on an album with Norman, I had done a special arrangement of Bay Forge, very different kind of arrangement, which actually like kind of a homage to Herbie and different influences like classical and R&B and jazz. So we all, and reharmonization, all that kind of stuff. And they were doing a playback in San Francisco. And um, he made a mention when he heard one section go by, he said, that's some bad, you know the other word, that's some bad. <laughs> okay, start, the rides were hit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I said, well, if Woody says bad, then I'm good to go. Well, when the record finally got released, they were supposed to send me like a demo or something. They never did. The record came out. I went to the record store, and I saw the record. I said, okay, man, oh, let me hear this, man. It just came out. some stuff on it. So he played it, and I said, man, something wrong with your speakers? Mm -hmm. so why? Man, there's something I did on here that it was the section that Woody said was something bad. Mm -hmm. And he did. So, man, your speakers must be broken. He said, man, my speakers work. Played it again, wasn't there. I said, okay, let me buy it. I'll take it home. I know my speakers work. <laughs> I put that bad boy on, and it wasn't there. I broke down and cried. Because, you know, they didn't understand. I was paying homage, not just doing an assignment, I was paying homage to 
the first I could see the mentor, which was Herbie Hancock. Mm. And they all passed the buck. Norman said, well, Skip said to, to get rid of it. Skip said, Norman said to get rid of it. The engineer didn't know anything. He said, hey, hey, run me. Oh, well, he's the one who pressed the button, the red button. But I had to learn to live with the new arrangement without all the instruments that were there. But uh, Woody asked me if I wanted to be in the band. And I wasn't sure. But I asked him, well, who else is in the band? Well, Victor Lewis is playing drums, and Carter Jefferson is playing saxophone, and Clint Houston is playing bass. Well, that was like a recipe for like, wow. So I said, yeah. <laughs> you know, if he had named anybody else, I might say, eh, I, don't know. I don't know. But I knew, because Victor and I were very close. We worked with Buster Williams a lot during that time. So I know it was something I wanted to do, and I knew Woody was an incredible player. And we did for almost, I think for almost two years, I played with Woody. And it's something that he did. Uh, he was going, he just got signed to Columbia Records. And I think we're in Canada, at a club in Canada, Montreal. And he said, well, Nigel, I want you to arrange this too. For the, for the album. So okay, it was called Rosewood. So I wasn't even familiar with the original recording of Rosewood, and being naive, I'm saying, okay, he likes trees. Okay. Rosewood, he likes trees. Okay, cool. And he didn't bother me. He didn't. He didn't question any of my ideas. He didn't say, how's it going? Let me see if it's okay. He left it totally up to me. And. Uh, of course, the record went on to get uh, a Grammy nomination, and it uh, won the Down the Beauty Pole, his best album. And it wasn't until years later that I realized what he had had me, what he had me do, what responsibility he had given me. Rosewood was not about a tree. Mm -hmm. Rose was his mother's name, and Wood was for Woody, which is his father's name. Huh. This was a tribute to his parents. Huh. He wanted me to arrange mm. this music to dedicate to his parents. Huh. And I said, okay. You know, it's, huh. you know, because the other cats were arrangers too. Um, Clint Houston was an arranger. Victor Lewis was an arranger. We later found out that Carter was an arranger because Woody would, he would just bash, verbally bash Carter, not because he was late for a gig, not because he was doing something unethical, because he hadn't put a tune in the book yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what he wanted. He wanted, listen, Carter, I mean, he would, he would go off on Carter. And away from one city to another in Europe, he said, where's the tune? Where's the music? Finally, Carter brought a tune into the band and I remember playing it, we used to rehearse at the Vanguard. We never had to pay money for rehearsal, we just go to the Vanguard and rehearse at the Vanguard. Because that's how Max Gordon was. Mm. See, Max Gordon is somebody that uh, so loved the music, unlike many club owners right now. Mm. Okay, Max loved the music. Uh, digress to Max for a minute is that um, I played on Stanley Jordan's record, um, Magic Touch. And it featured an arrangement of uh, Lady My Life by Michael Jackson. The reason I'm on that album is because of Max Gordon. Hmm. See, I had a ritual with Max where if I came by the Vanguard, and if you ever played the Vanguard once, see, with Max's book, you got in. You had a car blonde, you just walk in the club. Okay. So, um, a trumpet player who I met in Europe while I was playing with uh, Woody, he was in town. And it's years later, of course, he uh, had gotten an R&B group in L.A., stuff like that. But he was in town. He called me and said, listen, I want to see John Fattis. So I said, well, John Fattis just happens to be at the Vanguard this week. So meet me on 34th and 7th, and we'll go to the club. So as I said, uh, Max and I had this ritual where if I come to Vanguard, I go back and say hello to him. Now, one time I did that because he liked to sleep in the back of the club. 
uh, one time I went up to him because I had to stay true to my ritual, really acknowledging him, but he was asleep. <laughs> so I tried to like nudge him like, Max. So, now at this time, Kenny Monroe was in the club doing an unaccompanied acoustic guitar solo. Oh my God. Okay, so it was like pin drop time. But I'm just trying to be cool. He's doing his solo, but I'm trying to be cool. Baby, Max, said, hey, Max, how you doing? I said, Max, so nice. Oh, Najee, how you doing, guys? <laughs> <laughs> My wife doing the funniest thing in the world. I was totally embarrassed. <laughs> but moving fast forward to seeing John Fattis, I'm doing my ritual, going to say hello to, to Max. He says, uh, Najee, put a band together. Yeah, they got... Blue Note got this new guitar player named Stanley something. Stanley, Stanley, Stanley Jordan. Yeah, Stanley Jordan. Um, I want you to put the band together and play for him when he comes to the gig. Okay. So I got Jeff Tane Watts and uh, Anthony Cox. Hmm. So at the end of the run, um, I get a call from his manager, from Stanley's manager saying, Stanley wants you to play Lady of My Life on the record. Oh, okay. So we get to the studio, and um, we do Lady in My Life. This is now it's with um, Omar Hakeem, and uh, Lady William Brathways was a great bass player and uh, producer. So we're doing it with Al DeMille as a producer. And we do Lady in My Life as we did it at the Vanguard. And Al said, well, that's great, but all that's missing is Michael's voice. To him, it just sounded like a, a club day instrumental, you know. So the arrangement that you hear now for that song is what I came up with. After I went back into the studio, it came with the introduction and everything. It just kind of opened up, and uh, Al loved it, you know. So again, that was a result of the interest of a club owner in the musicians and really respect the musician. And he'd been listening to me, obviously, all this time working with Woody and different people. He'd been listening to me to know that I'm the one he wanted to work with this new guitar player. Okay, so bring it back around to Carter Jefferson. So Yo, Carter what? brought a tone in. Now, you ever hear a small group tune that you actually hear the whole orchestra? Hmm. To me, okay, I'll give an example. Blue Round Dollar Turk by Dave Brubeck. Mm -hmm. You know, when he when gets to the middle section, I hear the trumpets and the strings and the mm -hmm. brass and the percussion. Carter wrote a tune like that. I was like, wow, you waited all this time to come up with this. It was <laughs> it was called Rise from Atlantis. Hmm. And he ended up recording, and unfortunately I didn't get a chance to do it with him. But uh, it was worth the wait because this tune was so incredible. And I'm playing the tune, I'm hearing the brass section, I'm hearing the strings, I'm hearing the percussion. It was an incredible song. And um, we never did it with Woody, but fortunately, you know, Carter did record it, and unfortunately, it's out of print. But um, that's the kind of, of respect and the kind of, of a unity we had as a band. I mean, there was the, uh, the unity part, we were in Europe once and uh, got into a very crowded plane and wouldn't ask me to sit, into, sit in the first class because he was very hot and felt very closed in. And the uh, student said, no, you have to sit there. But he said, I just want to you know, cool out because I'm, I'm not feeling too well being closed in like this. And we all sit in different parts of the plane. So we start taxiing down the runway, and Whitney couldn't stand anymore. He said, turn the plane around. Go back to the hangar. I'm getting off this plane. They turned the plane around. Went back to the hangar, and I said, we're all in different parts of the, of the, of the, of the uh, plane. But our whole thing was, he was the leader of the band. So when he got up in the front, they got up over here, I got up from over here, Carter got up over here, we all went to playing with him. If he's going off, we going off. Turned out the plane was malfunctioning. Mm. We would never have gotten to our destination. 
Mm. And that's what, you know, the mm. tone was very hot, and Woody saved the lives of everybody in the plane by demanding the plane go back to the hangar. Wow. I want you, that, I think that's a good moment to go and to talk a little bit, to let you talk about your, uh, your spiritual beliefs and your practice of uh, Buddhism. Yes, I um, And then the last thing I want us to discuss is the, the tune that you wrote for your mom, okay? And then, okay. if it's okay. Oh, yes, yeah, okay. All right, and then we're gonna open it up. All right. Okay. Um, Before you go into that, I need to fix your mic. Got fixed this? Yeah, sorry. Can't hear me? Uh, yeah, the battery's ran out. Oh, the battery's ran out. Oh, okay, no, that's not no, good no, for sure. just ran out. Oh, okay, just good. Ran out. Okay. All right. <laughs> Y'all enjoying this? Yeah. All right. All right. So we're going to get y'all here in a moment. You know, as I mentioned, I, I, grew up, I grew up in a church, the Methodist church. Just one second, one second. Let, let people settle down. Okay, so folks, I'm going to settle down. We're going to have them tell this last piece here. Talk about this wonderful tune for his mom, and then y'all get a chance to make some comments and ask some questions, all right? Okay, so continue. Okay, as I mentioned before, I grew up in the Methodist Church. Um, but at that time, I met Norman, and I did that piece for his album. Uh, Farrell was coming on the week after Herbie Hancock. So the week that Herbie was there, Buster Williams and uh, Benny Maupin were introducing people on their travels to uh, Buddhism, to uh, SGI. Uh, Nishri Bashonan's Buddhism. At that time it was called NSA, but now it's called uh, the SGI USA Nishri of Practice of Nishri Bashonan's Buddhism. So he didn't actually introduce me directly. There were two young brothers who actually been introduced by, by Buster, and they came back to me and said, You got to talk to Buster, man, about this stuff. You know, now the Hori Kek, yo, man, it's, it's great. So I was saying, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, but I was intrigued because I respected these two men. So I, I called Buster and I was, he said, listen, I'm at the club, let's talk about this tomorrow. So we spent like two hours the next day talking about this Buddhism. And I really just kind of related to it because I had a very positive uh, premise and the fact that just chanting these words, now we are going to get really changing your life. Um, and I started to practice. That was in October of 72, and then May of 73, I received what's called Lake Gohonza, which is called the True Object of Worship, which is like, in musical terms, for me, it's like the piano. In other words, the piano doesn't play by itself. The piano is a vehicle to bring out my talents as a pianist. The Gohonza is a physical manifestation of the condition that exists in my life. And it's a true object to bring that condition, we call high life condition or Buddhahood, Buddha nature, out. So uh, it's not a god, it's not uh, an idol, but it's a vehicle by which you can then focus to bring the best out of your life. Such as, just as I can't go to guitar and play great guitar, I go to the piano. The piano brings out that best to me that is the pianist. And I've been doing that since 73. And uh, I found that uh, through this practice, and it took a lot of growing because there were some superficial attitudes that I had towards this practice, almost like a genie kind of thing or whatever. But realizing that uh, in the long run that the experiences that we have, as I mentioned before, we talked about slavery, everything happens for a reason. And it's not the situation in of itself that determines our victory or defeat, but how we choose to address it, how we choose to address the situation, okay? And we can gain benefit from every single situation that happens in our lives. Even when we lose a loved one, uh, it's about how do we now function? You know, how do we use that experience, even that pain, to move forward? And what can we do to be bring our lives to its fullest potential. And realize that that person's death was actually something that really 
helps us to move forward. And actually, I can segue into the piece for my mother, which unfortunately I did not write. Um, I'm trying to remember, which is a standard piece for the family.